Um, um, Tara just read the title, and we are from the Analysis and Nowcast branch of the Analysis and Mission Support Division of the Analyze, Forecast, and Support or AFS Office. Okay, so one of one of the prior missions of our branch is to address the needs of the forecasters for improving various analysis and outcast systems. And for that, we are collecting fields input by various means, including community web fora and field surveys. So from the information we collected, we found that Ultimate Irma reveals some systematic biases, especially over complex terrain. <clears throat> so in order to identify these biases and develop the requirements for Ultimate Irma, we are analyzing outstanding weather events reported by the field utilizing our framework. We process some um, postings found from the Villa Forum on RTM Irma for the last few years and kind of found that more issues are reported by the Western and Central regions over areas of large terrain variations, including mountains, valleys, coasts, and islands, mainly for temperatures and winds. And um, those are largely associated with observation data quality control and station flagging. Also, we recently conducted um, a separate survey on Altium Irma and kind of confirmed that winds and in a collective sense, temperatures are reported as the most inadequate out of the system. And errors in quality control and model background as well as lack of data are reported as major technical issues. And cold pools, high wind, and precip events in complex terrain are reported as the most difficult phenomena to be captured by the system. So for our VNB purpose, uh, we constructed our own VNB framework, which is basically interface with the UFS MedPlus verification framework. And the UFS framework basically takes in two different types of data, model forecast and observations and analysis as verification. And we designed the framework uh, to um, first um, process some data as common environmental data for our intercomparison purposes. That is fed into the MedPlus framework. And the other component is uh, uh, to prepare for um, single or multiple data, data sets from um, any analysis or now casting systems for our comparison purposes. And we, we designed the framework uh, so that those we provide the systems with some common initial and boundary conditions for a fair and objective intercomparison of the systems. But for this particular uh, year, we are evaluating RTM Irma, which is normally a verification system that is used for um, UFS MedPlus framework. So we are making a special application of the framework that we built. And we um, collected um, cases from the field, and I'm going to present a couple of cases. One of them is the cold pool over complex terrain in the Rio Grande Valley area. <clears throat> so there was a report from WFO Pueblo noting that RTM Irma low temperatures were too warm in the Rio Grande Valley area in the morning of December 1st last year. And some temperatures were warmer than the station offs by as much as 20 degrees. And here's the area with a lot of valleys and there is a Mita station, which is Wolf Creek Pass. And this is pretty well-known phenomena called cold pool gener generated by valley effect. And obviously the system is having trouble <clears throat> capturing this phenomena. And we checked some temperatures. Uh, KCPW is the location here nearest to the problem area. And it's clear that there is cold pool observed uh, in this time. And there are a couple of other stations showing even colder uh, region in later hours. And there is one that doesn't show anything. But the mean of this uh, station in the box that didn't capture the cold pole. And <clears throat> it's important to note that Irma didn't capture it either. And based on the survey you conducted, uh, the field forecasters won 
the temperature errors to be less than three degrees. So this is a huge discrepancy. So this cold pole represented in some meter stations uh, were not actually represented. And this forecaster in particular complained that there are a lot of weather underground sites in this Pentagon box. And he, she wished to um, have a good use of those data, but unfortunately, um, the circumstances do not allow <clears throat> that we use those data. And there's another case, uh, which is about wind gust over complex terrain in the Columbia, Columbia River Gorge area. <coughs> Excuse me. So there was a report from WFO uh, Portland, Oregon, noting that Altima Irma wind speeds were too low compared with uh, observation like uh, over the Portland International Airport. And this area is known to have high mountains to the east. And they tend to produce strong downslope wind storms and also gap flow flowing along the river. So this gap flow generated by director, directional channeling doesn't seem to be well captured by system. And this is an example of that. And we checked some wind values. <clears throat> and K PDX is the location of the airport. Uh, it clearly shows strong wind gust in late morning and early afternoon. However, other nearby stations didn't quite show that, but there are indications of wind gust in late hours. But they fluctuate a lot. And this is the mean of those stations and did not feel the wind gust. And Irma didn't capture it either because um, um, although the temperatures were better than the meter mean, and the field wants the tolerance to be less than five knots or 2.6 meters per second. So this is again a strong discrepancy. So it seems to, seems to be that the wind gusts represented in these stations were not was not represented in Irma. And this and the previous case, uh, the reason may be because uh, the model background is inaccurate and maybe the data quality control was not adequate. And we see a lot of cases like this. So this is not some episodical uh, events that was misrepresented by Altima Irma. So what we are doing is performing VNV of the field needs on Altima Irma. <clears throat> and please note that we are not doing the regular, I mean, typical VNV of any systems taking advantage of um, some good known metrics. Instead, we are focusing on those um, outstanding weather events reported by the field. And I think we presented some examples of systematic biases of a complex terrain involving some phenomena like cold pool and wind gust. And we are um, analyzing a lot, of, we'll be analyzing a lot of cases like this, but we are also performing gap analysis and this is schematics of showing uh, how we analyze, I mean, complex physical mechanisms around topography, but no time to describe this. This is just for your information. So based on this uh, VNV of these and other cases and also gap analysis, we are developing operational requirements, which will be validated through the National Weather Service governance process, which will be delivered to the developers to help them elevate these biases systematically. Okay. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you, YJ. Um, uh, there, it doesn't appear that there's any questions in the verification and evaluation Slack channel, but I'll give it a minute just to see if someone wants to write a question in there. Um, while we're waiting on that, if we can have Mike Erickson, um, if you can stop sharing so Mike Erickson can start sharing, that would be great. Okay. Thanks. Michelle, do you see any questions coming in? I do not, Tara. Okay. Well, um, the Slack channel is there, so um, YJ, you know, let, after the session, if you want to go in and see if there are any particular questions that came up, um, feel free to go ahead and answer those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker is Mike Erickson from the Weather Prediction Center, talking about object-based verification of NSSLs worn on forecast ensemble during the 2019 warm season. Um, we can see your slides, so that's great, Mike. Awesome, great. Thank you and very much, Tara. 
your sound check is good. So um, you, I'll come back on when you have two minutes left. All right, great. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. So I did want to acknowledge my collaborators from Oklahoma and a lot of their help uh, working on a great project with them. They provided a lot of the worn on forecast data and, and a lot of the guidance on this study. So um, basically, this is going to involve tracking heavy precipitation objects. And why do we want to do that? Well, tr basically to uh, treat heavy precipitation like how they appear to the human eye, uh, which is they, they look like objects. So and we want to avoid the, the issue of double, the so-called double penalty, where this image simplified, super simplified off on the right, you have an observation to forecast the leftmost image, there are no overlap, but they're super close together. Uh, another one, they're rather displaced and a standard grid-based verification, they would score no better, even though the object on the far right, clearly there's a bigger displacement issue. So what we're using for this is the model evaluation tools and within that the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation time domain i'm just going to call it mtd because uh, it's a little bit shorter but uh, basically using mtd we track heavy precipitation objects and the way that that works is it merges objects so if you have within the same field model or analysis two objects that are sufficiently close together they're combined into one uh, and the other one, the one that we, we definitely care about is matching or pairing. And we can use these two figures here for the model and analysis shown here in the more right. Uh, this green object, if we, we can pair them together, if their object attributes are sufficiently similar. And the big one for that is, are they in the same region? And the answer is yes, but you can also tune this to look for major axis orientation angle or something along those lines. So we're gonna be using the worn on forecast 15 minute QPF and comparing that to the MRMS. And this is going to be for the 2019 warm season, but we just don't wanna uh, run MTD out of the box. We wanna, we wanna make sure it's tracking the things that we're seeking out. So uh, we did some sensitivity studies here by varying some of the tuning parameters within MTD specifically three of them over 27 sensitivity studies. And we varied the amount of smoothing, the convolution radius, as well as the space centroid weight, which basically how important is the spatial separation uh, for matching and merging. The third one is how far out do you want to look spatially for, for, for pairing basically. Uh, and what we did is uh, we, we looked at four cases in 2018. Um, and I tracked these guys subjectively by eye first, and then using these 27 sensitivity studies, compared the two. So here, basically, the goal is to not really um, evaluate the forecast yet. It will be, but, but to optimize the tracker. So what's shown here for one case, July 12, 2018, um, and I went through uh, and identified three different objects in the model and the observation. It pans out well. Basically, what happens is you have one object initiate in the western part of the domain, uh, a little bit later on, and then you have two other objects initiate first in the observation and then the model. Uh, so what we're seeking when we actually run the tracker is something similar, and I'm not going to show uh, 27 different animations here, but basically just looking at two, six, and seven, um, I should point out here basically the little gray outline, that's basically your model object, uh, black outline is going to be your observed object, uh, the little marker symbols there, those guys are going to be the location of the object centroid. The color is the 90th percentile of the, the object. So basically, you can think of it as a rough max that's experienced by a decent amount of precipitation area within the object. So test two doesn't do very well. It just identifies one object in the southwest domain here. Test seven identifies one object by merging all three objects together. And basically, the centroid moves to the center of the mass at the current time but object six does what we would like and identifies three different objects. So uh, rather than showing all four different test cases, one thing I did was just go through by eye, look at all the sensitivity tests on the X axis and rank it one if it was good, zero if it wasn't. So it can be anywhere between zero and four. And I found tests six and 15 did well for that and throw in some contingency table stats, found test six did the best for that. So basically, uh, sensitivity test six is the configuration we're using for in this particular study. So I mentioned earlier, we're using the worn on forecast ensemble. 15 minute objects, basically either 0.1 inches every 15 minutes or 0.4 inches per hour, if you prefer to think of it that way. But this type of tracking can be extended to any model or ensemble. I've tracked the HER and, and, and anything coming up in the UFS. So uh, basically what I'm gonna be looking at here 
is the paired object. So comparing model and observation differences, the way that we can gather the statistics, we can envision this guy showing up over here on the left. Um, so what's shown here is for a specific case, this is just hourly, is here we have our model initiate. We can call this t equals two. Um, and then let's say an hour later, t equals three. That, that object is a little bit more intense. It's a little bit bigger. There's still no analysis object. So this is just the model. T equals four, bigger, more intense. And then finally, T equals five, the analysis object initiates. So we can look at things like differences in initiation. Um, I won't be showing that here, but it is handy to look at that, as well as differences in um, the current hour. So displacement, the model is displaced to the southwest. The model intensity is, is higher. The model object is bigger for this case. So what we can do is gather all of these different um, stats and, and look at them in different ways throughout the 2019 warm season when the worn on forecast was run. So one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this was to generate a plot like this. On the left is the displacement and intensity biases specifically for forecast hours three to six and then your object count on the right. So one thing we generally notice is um, actually I should point out what these arrows actually mean is so focusing on this arrow um, generally over far northeastern Wyoming that pointing off to the northeast means compared to the observation, the model is displaced to the northeast. The magnitude is related to this key here. So anything with an arrow length more than 100 kilometers means a more than 100 kilometer displacement on the average. And one thing we generally know is that we have a little bit of a displacement toward the east and the western high plains and a little bit of a displacement in the model back to the west if you get into the Midwest region. But not really that bad. Displacements are not really noticeable at all. Um, uh, and also, I should look at object size here. Uh, generally there, we have maybe objects a little bit too big in the central plains, uh, stretch, stretching up into the upper Midwest. But generally, um, these, these aren't too bad in terms of biases in this case. And then one fun thing to do is to look at the spread. So we can break these things up by domain shown here. So um, one thing to point out, domain two, southern plains, a lot of your model objects are displaced to the northeast. In domain three, they're displaced more to the west. So that was reflected more in the stats in the last figure. In domain five, we kind of see displacement off to the southwest and northeast. So assuming objects move northwest to southeast, that could be some cross-track errors there for domain five. And then finally here we have area bias. So- um, Just think about two minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, here what's shown is object count and then your area difference uh, for those domains. So not really that bad. This is by diurnal hours. So we're binning, we're, we're conditionalizing the data probably more than what we should at this point. Um, and we noticed that in terms of uh, object area difference um, by time of day, it's, it's actually really good. And we note that for regions like domain five, we have our peak object count in the late afternoon as you'd expect. Domains one, two, and three more so overnight hours, as also you'd expect. So uh, in conclusion, we've adapted this to the worn on forecast. We've also done this for the HER as well in one hour increments. Um, but this can be extended to um, other, it depends basically on the scale that you wanted to track for this. Um, and what we find is the worn on forecast does pretty well with biases overall. Um, and that is, whoops, that is basically it for me. So thank you. All right, uh, Michelle, do we have any questions? I still do not see any questions up on the Slack channel. Okay, um, so just a, a quick question for you, Mike. Um, I know that in the past you've shared some of your plotting scripts with the Met Plus developers. Um, uh, are you, is this uh, method developed enough to um, warrant working with you to develop a use case so that we can put it into the Met Plus repository? Uh, I would say that we're we're definitely getting there. Um, it, it's it's sort of subject to my my typical <laughs> wonderful coding, I guess you can say. But um, I, it's basically what I've shown today is 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 a lot more um, figures that weren't previously existing in terms of uh, I guess you can say creating conditional biases. So I would say I would say very shortly, probably later this summer, early fall. It would it would definitely be a good idea to kind of get in touch and, and work with that because I think that would be great. Okay, thank you. And sure. Tara, we do have one question. I don't know if we have time. We just sure, we can it. Yes, right. please. Uh, this is from YJ Kim. Um, should the domain sizes be the same for fair comparison? 
Yes, um, it, it, there, there's two tricky things, especially with Warren on forecast is uh, I probably didn't mention this directly, even though it was in the text that it's it's um, a regional domain. So we only run it over a, a smaller subset of, of CONUS and it, it can pick similar domains depending on active weather, which is why I showed the sample size. So for fair comparison, we also want to keep in mind where that domain was run in addition to having uh, the domain sizes for fair comparison. So yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you. In the interest of time, we're gonna move on now. So thank you. Um, Shia Sun can um, go ahead and, and share yes. her screen. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Okay, and we can see your screen and we okay. can hear you. And uh, once you're in present mode. Yeah, I'll put it to full screen. So Jia is um, from NOAA GSL as well as DTC and we'll be talking about case studies that exemplify um, known biases of USF, um, UFS uh, global model. So yeah. take it away. Thank you, Tara. So mm -hmm. um, I'm a research scientist at the NOAA GSL. Uh, I'm going to present some results for the case studies that are associated with the known basis of the UFS model. So there are several known forecast challenges for the GFS version 15. So these challenges are related to the basis in terms of precipitation, two meter temperature, surface-based temperature inversions, hurricane tracks, synoptic patterns, and non-tropical loads. So to help address these physics-related problems, this project will create tools and resources that will be uh, shared among the broad community. So specifically, the objectives will be to uh, create new output and tendencies from the physics parameterizations, as well as a set of case studies that can be used by the community to test their physics innovations. Now, this project will also exercise the HTF to enhance its capabilities and provide the physics development direction for the UFS. So the expected outcome would be a community-supported set of tools that can facilitate the physics development. So currently, we have six case studies included in our catalog. So it uh, includes one cold bias case and one Denver inversion case and two hurricanes and a 2019 Halloween storm, which is related to the synoptic pattern basis. So uh, below is the figure of the SQT log B plot from the simulations and the sounding profiles. And in the bottom shown are the calculated indexes uh, related to something such as cap strength and cap values. So moving forward to the results for the Hurricane Barry. So the model runs in our project were conducted using the UFS medium range weather app version 1.0. So 1.0 has two physics composites. One is GFS V15P2 and the GFS V16 beta. So the version 1.0 was released in March this year. So any updates of the models that after this date will not be shown in this talk. So back to the results. So the figure shows the simulated tracks and as well as from the best track data, which uh, serves as truth in our case. So for the black dashed line, which is the best track data, is located in the leftmost line. And in the middle is the red dashed line, which is from the results of the 15P2. And the rightmost blue dashed line is from the 16 beta. And uh, you can see from the results that the hurricane track simulated by the 15P2 uh, shifts the eastward compared with the best track. But the intensities, which is represented uh, by the vortex maximum 10 meter wind speed is similar to the best track. And uh, for the um, 16 beta, the TC track is moved further eastward compared with 15P2. So in comparison with satellite images, we plotted the outgoing long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere at the forecast hour uh, of 72. So uh, we use the OIR at the TOA as a pro proxy of the cloud coverage because when uh, the OIR is uh, in lower values, which is indicated by white color. So this means there, uh, there was cloud present. 
um, because of the colder cloud tops compared with the surface. So if uh, in comparison with the satellite data, we can also see that the storm is located the east side of the track. And uh, the OIR at the TOA for the uh, 16 beta is larger than the uh, than the version 15P2. So this means um, the, the tropical cyclone center, the storm is shallower in 16 beta compared with 15P2 with less le with smaller cloud coverage. So to inspect the, the evolution with time of the Hurricane Barry, we did the plot of the uh, radius time plot of the wind speed at 850 millibars. Uh, as well as the uh, radius of the maximum wind, which is denoted by the white line. So uh, you can see that overall the low level wind in the GFS model is weaker than the GFS analysis data. And if we, oops, if we focus on the white line in the GFS uh, 16 beta, we can see that the storm is shallower and the uh, inner core size is larger in the 16 beta compared with the 15P2 and analysis. So if we focus on from the y-axis with the forecast hour, we can see how the hurricane barrier evolves with time. And uh, the hurricane intensity attenues faster in the model compared with the analysis. So for the 2019 Halloween storm, which is related to the synoptic pattern biases, we plotted the uh, 500 millibar geopotential height, which is the control lines, and the absolute vorticity, which is the control colors. Uh, it's valid, valid at the forecast hour, uh, hour of 156. And uh, for the storm, the storm moved across the, the eastern US. And uh, if we see the results, we can see that the 15P2 generate a progressive synoptic pattern compared with the analysis. However, for the 16 beta, it kind of alleviated the progressiveness, but generate a regressiveness of uh, the synoptic patterns. So uh, regarding to the two meter temperature, uh, so we use a color bar we, when the temperature is above 288K, it will be showing white. And uh, if you focus on the eastern um, coast cities of the US, you can see how the different cold air masses are pushing to the eastern coast differently in the uh, analysis data and in the um, models. So overall for the 15P2, uh, the two meter temperature is lower along the US east coast. And uh, for the 16 beta, the two meter temperature is colder over the near England area and the two meter is warmer over the southeast in the 16 beta. So this uh, slide shows uh, the demonstration of the UFS case study documentation. We have set up a website as well as a GitHub repo that shares the resources we currently have. So the leftmost is an index page which introduces which uh, app version we used. And the red panel is the one case results for the Denver inversion case. So there is a um, command line the users can just copy paste to their um, command line to do the configuration. And we provide the links for the initial conditions and below is the results analysis. And for the last, last section of this website will be the example scripts. So we shared several scripts for now. Uh, for example, for the um, common 500 millibar geopotential height and the vorticity map. Uh, so this website is still uh, in developing stage and we'll add more cases to this website. That's it, thank you. All right, perfect timing. Thank you. Um, Michelle, are there any questions on Slack? You know, it looked like there was a comment, but it was deleted. So um, I believe we're back to having no comments. So okay. nothing on the Slack channel. That was me, and I can post it, but for the sake of time, we skip. OK. Thank you, YJ. OK. All right. So Jai, if you can um, uh, answer the question on the Slack channel, that would be great. Uh, OK, I will answer offline. Yeah. Yes, please. OK. Um, sure. Okay, so why don't we um, have Rona Patel um, from North Carolina State University, sorry if I butchered your first name, um, talk to us about frequent GFS biases in winter season surface forecasts. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, 
guys. We can see your slides. Okay, can you hear me? But we cannot hear you at this time. Can you hear me now? Hello? I can hear you, but you're very quiet. louder for you guys or is it still quiet yeah it's still pretty quiet but we can hear it. You're, you're um a little louder now can you turn up the volume anymore uh let's see if i can get the there we go. microphone settings what do you think michelle can can you hear him okay that's better now yes okay this is better for everybody much better thank you Okay, I don't know what happened, but okay, so I want to talk about the frequent GFS biases in the winter season surface forecast. I want to thank all my collaborators, couldn't have done this without them, and I also want to thank Delta Airlines for funding this research. So our main objectives for this study, we wanted to investigate the frequent biases in the operational GFS, so that would be the GFS version 15 for surface variables that are important for airport operations. Specifically, we want to look at the temperature, both the daily low temperature and the hourly temperature, and the hourly precipitation. We want to look at the hourly variables, mostly because the timing for a lot of these planning for irregular operations is quite important. We also wanted to look at the relationship between these variables and other variables, such as wind speed, sky cover, and snow cover. We looked at forecast lead times of much greater than 24 hours, mostly because those are important to planning for irregular operations in aviation, sometimes going out to four and five days, but this presentation is gonna focus on forecast lead times of 48 hours. So what we did is we obtained the GFS hourly forecast output in real time from NSTEP, and then we interpolated that to the location of over 200 ASOS sites across the United States, and then matched it with the corresponding observations in a relational database. So using that database, we analyzed this past winter's worth of data, November 2019 through March 2020. The first thing we wanted to look at was the low temperature median bias. So this is a uh, geographic distribution and the magnitude of these biases at the 48 hour lead times across the United States. So you can see that in general, most of the biases are about plus or minus one degree Celsius off from observation. So it's nothing too extreme across most of the country. The next thing we wanted to do is look at what happens if we condition these biases on light winds. So light winds would be less than five knots and less than half the sky covered by clouds. And what we see at this point is the magnitude of the bias goes up quite a bit to about three, four, and even five degrees Celsius as a median. So that is quite a large bias under these conditions. And you can see that especially these are prevalent along the Southern Plains region of the United States. So taking a closer look at a certain cases where these are prevalent along the Southern Plains, we have Dallas in the bottom left. You can see the distribution of temperature errors by time of day and Oklahoma City in the bottom right. I put the sunrise and approximate sunrise times on both these charts just to get an idea. And you can see that in the hours just before sunrise when the time of lowest temperature typically occurs. The model temperatures are about four degrees Celsius or about seven degrees Fahrenheit too warm. And this is characteristic of a lot of airports across this region. And difficult, these conditions, light winds and clear skies are associated with stronger nocturnal inversions. And this is indicative of that PBL issue in the model. The next thing we noticed is um, when we were looking at snow cover, specifically the temperature bias when there is snow cover present in the model, this wasn't just during the morning hours like the other bias predominantly was. This actually we noticed during the entire day across most of the region, there was about a couple of degrees Celsius cool bias present in the models. So taking a look at some locations where this is prevalent, Sioux Falls, South Dakota on the bottom left and then Minneapolis and Minnesota on the bottom right. You can see that about throughout the entire day, the model 
temperatures are about two to four degrees cool compared to the observations. Something we wanted to make sure of is we wanted to see how does this bias represent itself or does it when we don't have snow cover present. So now on the bottom right, you can see the temperature distribution of errors by time of day in Sioux Falls when we don't have snow cover. So as you can see, the magnitude of these biases is much less during this time. And there is still a slight cool bias at some times of day, mostly during the end of the afternoon and the evening, but this is much less of a magnitude than when we do have snow cover. The next thing we wanted to look at is precipitation. This is the false alarm rate for measurable precipitation. So that would be one one hundredth of an inch at a 48 hour lead time. And you can see that typically along the Gulf Coast region in the Florida, there's or about 60 to 80 percent false alarm rate for this at this lead time, which means about 70 percent of the time when the model forecasts measurable precipitation occurring in a certain hour, none is actually observed. You can see similar high magnitude values along the Intermountain West region of the United States, whereas in the Mid-Atlantic going up to New England, there are re relatively low values of false positives of rainfall at this lead time. So more than just any sort of precipitation, airport operations are specifically sensitive to snow and other frozen precipitation. So we want to do something similar for hourly snow forecast, the success rate. So what percent of the time when the model forecast snow at a certain hour is snow actually observed. So what you can see on this map is unlike a lot of the other maps we've seen throughout the presentation, there really aren't that many geographic coherencies and it's not too much of a geographic distribution of these um, success rates. So you can go like a couple of airports right next to each other and they can be vastly different with how good they are at picking up the snowfall weather it's observed at a certain time. The next thing we wanted to do is look at of the specific precipitation types, how does the forecast compare with observations? So in this chart, given the GFS forecasted precipitation, either none, snow, rain, freezing rain, or mixed, what is actually observed by the ASOS site. And if we did have a perfect forecast at the lead time, you'd see 100% going down the columns, which means everything is predicted perfectly. But Minneapolis is actually one of the sites that it does better on at this lead time, where about 65% of the time when snow is forecasted by the model, snow is actually observed, so that's actually pretty good, and only 26% of the time does nothing fall. What we did notice is when rain is forecast, it's pretty much evenly split between whether nothing, snow, or rain is actually observed, so that's still a challenge at that lead time. A city where we have more of like a worse performance issue is Salt Lake City, again, in the Intermountain West region of the United States, where when snow is forecast by the model, snow is only observed about 45% of the time, where 46% of the time nothing is observed. And you can also see a large false alarm rate for rain also evident at 52%. Two and minutes to go. Perfect timing. So just wrapping up with our general findings, we noticed the large nocturnal warm bias during conditions associated with stronger nocturnal inversions. We also noticed during periods of snow cover on the ground, there's model cool biases present at all times of day. We also noticed there's an overprediction of hours exceeding a low hourly precip threshold across most of the US with higher values across the Gulf Coast region. And then there are some airports that such as Salt Lake City and Philadelphia that frequently observed many fewer hours of snow than actually forecast, which makes it difficult to trust in operations. And that's it. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any questions, Michelle? Let's see, let me refresh the Slack. Um, I do not see any on Slack, but it looks like um, Jeff Manikin asked a question in the chat here. And we said, I may have missed the detail, but did you interpolate gridded GFS forecasts to the sites or did you use the surface or did you use the station time series buffer data? We interpolated the gridded GFS to the sites. Okay. Right. Excellent. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I, I think we're going to continue on. But um, I noticed that there were a couple of other questions that came in for Cha. Um, uh, while you were talking, so maybe some questions um, for you will come in while our next speaker 
who's Wei Wei Li, um, will be talking. So okay, let me try to share my screen. So Wei Wei is from NCAR and the Developmental Test Bed Center, and um, is going to be talking about evaluating model physics in the UFS medium range, uh, medium range weather application. So can you see my full screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I'm very glad to give a brief introduction about our recent test and evaluation activity for evaluating model physics in the unified forecast system near range weather application. So here you can see all of the DTC's global test and evaluation team who have contributed and conducted all of the tests and evaluation for this activity, including me, myself, Ligia Bernadette, uh, Michelle Hera, Dan D'Amico, Sun Xia, uh, Lu Ningxue, Judy Henderson, Jimmy Dudia, Grant Furl, Bray Nelson, Mike Yak. So um, I want to thank to all of them. All right, so in this test and evaluation activity, we have two components, major components. The first part is to evaluate the model physics in the UFS Mr. Weather model. Uh, for this part, we uh, do the verification and evaluation for the global runs. And the second part is an exercise of using single count model uh, in CCPP under the hierarchical test framework. So for this part, um, just to showcase the hierarchical test framework and help sort out the biases contributions that we will briefly show in this talk, but with more physics related evidence. So I just wanna promote this talk, which will be presented by Dan D'Amico tomorrow at plenary session at 11.45 Eastern. All right, uh, so but for today, I'm going to uh, briefly cover the first part. All right, so uh, in this TA activity, we conducted our own runs. So basically we uh, run free forecast or co-star forecast that was initialized from the GFS analysis and the model configurations were listed below. So we used the C768, uh, which is approximately 13 kilometer in resolution with 64 level uh, in vertical. And we used the public release uh, version uh, 1.0 of the UFS weather uh, Mr. Weather model uh, with the CCPP's uh, GFS version 16 beta physics suite. And uh, there is a, there are 32 runs in total and the forecast was up to day five. So basically the, uh, we cover the period in, um, or the model initialization period from October last year to March this year. And the model was initialized every five days alternating between zero and 12 uh, UTC cycles. And we did additional case just to pair with the lasso case that will be shown in the single count model um, study that will be presented tomorrow. And for this test and evaluation, we come up with an array of analysis, including uh, our own med based uh, verification, our uh, in house diagnostics. And we did use two benchmark data sets, including operational GFS forecast, just to make sure uh, what's being improved and what's being degraded compared to the operational forecast in terms of version 16 beta. And we also use some observations, including uh, precipitation, cloud radiation, and soundings. All right, so here list all of the evaluation items that we examined during this activity. So I'm now going into the details of all of, all of them uh, for the sake of time, because we only have 10 minutes, but uh, I will just highlight some major foundings in this activity, in this talk. So um, as usual, here shows the, um, the convention, conventionally used uh, uh, MED-based scorecards. So this is the very first step. You want to uh, verify a operational forecast model. So uh, here we examine the scorecards in terms of RMC, root mean square errors, and bias. So basically, you don't have to focus on the details of the, um, the cars, but Pink denotes that version 16 beta is better than operational GFS. So here shows all of the large scale environmental uh, variables that we usually examine. I will have a summarized table later, so don't focus on this now. And then we also uh, look at the 500 ACC, which are, which is again, uh, typically used in the operational verification. So briefly, as you can see here, red color ha uh, has larger value of ACC compared to uh, blue color, which means version 16 beta is better than operational GFS uh, with the forecast lead time increases. So here shows the summarized table based on the scorecards and the ACC. So as you, as you can see here, in terms of RMC for all of the large scale environmental uh, variables, we see uh, the version 16 beta outperforms the operational GFS 
uh, for most of the large scale environmental variables. But if we look at the, the table in terms of bias, as we see here uh, for all of the parameters uh, around 850, we see uh, the version six in beta is actually degraded. So we uh, suspect maybe something wrong with the model's PBL physics. So that's why we want to zoom into the uh, model uh, systematic bit errors and uh, uh, model forecast biases. So here shows the vertical profiles of uh, the GFS forecast against the observation uh, for both hemispheres. And here shows temperature, relative humidity, and the wind speed. The red color, red color again denotes the version 6 beta, and blue color denotes the operational GFS. So the takeaway from this slide is uh, there is a systematic errors of being cold, uh, particularly at lower levels or uh, atmospheric boundary layer and the moist and the less windy condition in the GFS analysis. And this is actually consistent with the bias that we found in the GFS forecast, including version 16 beta physics with an operational GFS. So uh, again, we see there is a cold, uh, moist and active uh, wind bias in the forecast. And for the version 6 in beta, we find there is a milder cold bias, but more humid conditions. Uh, and also the, the weaker winds uh, bias is kind of uh, slightly milder. Um, we also did the same thing for conas, which shared the similar systematic errors and biases. Uh, for the time being, we don't show the results here. But next, we want to zoom into the conas uh, by the, uh, for the time being and the interest being. So here shows uh, the time series of uh, some PBL related parameters, including two meter temperature, wind speed at 10 meter and PBL height. The horizontal axis shows the forecast lead time. The vertical axis shows the bias. So basically, again, the color uh, is consistent with what I have talked about. The red and blue denotes different forecast. So overall, there is a code bias and uh, the code bias has some diurnal variations. And you also notice if you look at Eastern uh, Konas, the bias is kind of larger. So we see the code bias increases with the forecast lead time over the East Konas. And there is an overly stronger near surface wind and the PBL height is kind of higher uh, over the Eastern. And there is a larger nighttime temperature wind biases if you can figure out uh, the time variation in terms of these uh, plots. And compared to the Eastern, we see there is a less, uh, the Western Konas has less problem, um, obviously. And uh, for version 16 beta, um, there's a slightly less cold bias and uh, less windy again. And PBL height might be deeper actually compared to operational GFS. So these are all of the errors and the biases that we, ended, we identified at the very first step of evaluation. And then we want to zoom into a little deeper in terms of this problem. So as we see here, this is the spatial distribution of, uh, of the PBL height as the left panel shows. And then we see um, in the middle panel shows the two meter temperature bias. And the last uh, panel shows the 10 meter wind speed. So uh, here, the first plot shows the GFS analysis and then the difference between the forecast and the analysis. And then the version six in beta minus operational GFS. So I just want to say uh, from these three panels, we find that the PBL height is higher in northeastern uh, conus, no matter for the version 6 meta or operational GFS. And uh, this is, um, if we look at the same location, we see there is a cold bias. Actually, there is a cold bias, not warm bias. And um, the same location we identified uh, is super windy over this northeastern uh, conus, or you can call it Great Lakes. So basically, we see that uh, the higher PBL is not consistent with the code bias or the surface uh, biases, but uh, co-located with uh, the, the windy condition that we identified with in the same location. So uh, there are some hypotheses uh, that we think we can uh, try to explain this one. So basically, uh, for the stronger winds, we suspect there is an under, underrepresented surface drag in the PBL scheme. And also nearly spatial, uh, as we see here, this is wintertime forecast. So the PBL tend to be neutral and stable. So maybe there's some um, formulation that try to uh, resolve the stability condition uh, went wrong in the model physics suite. And also we suspect maybe the orographic variability is underrepresented, especially over the Great Lakes. You know, there is snow and ice. Um, there is some uh, such kind of conditions over there. 
And, and last, again, as I mentioned, maybe um, there's pro some problems in the stability function in the surface beam. So next, we want to uh, develop this relationship between the extreme. Can you wrap up? Yeah. So, okay. um, yes. So I just want to briefly uh, say something about this relationship, exchange coefficient uh, and uh, with the wind speed altimeter. So as it, you can see here, normally we want to see this curve, but now we see for a given amount of wind speed, we see uh, the, the exchange coefficient is over predicted. And again, back up our sus uh, suspicion about that the, uh, there is some stability function issue in the surface scheme of the physics scheme. Mm -hmm. And also the last one I want to wrap up, uh, we found there is a contradiction between cloud diagnostic outputs and radiation biases, which needs to be uh, further explored. So here shows the summary. I'm sorry about the 10 minutes limit that I said with myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can read through this. I guess being you're one of the organizers, you know, you're allowed to have a, an extra minute or two. Um, That's fine. <laughs> uh, Michelle, are, I, in the interest of time, I think we're going to skip comments, but are there any um, in Slack that she should address? Um, there is one comment from YJ. It is not a question, but it is a good comment. So I would encourage Weiwei to, to read up on that. Okay, sounds good. I'll take a look. Thanks. All right. Okay, and if I'm you stop sharing. then we're going to have um, Maria Ganey from University of Boulder series and um, Noah PSL um, presenting. Tropical Diagno Dynamics Diagnostics for Numerical Weather Prediction. Maria, are you trying to share? Yes. Yes, I am. Can you hear me too? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Um, and Let's see. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, we can see your presentation. If you go ahead and, and put it in present mode, then I think we're going to be good. How's that look? Yep, we're good to go. So all right, very good. Um, so, so I want to talk about um, something we've been thinking about for a while, which is looking at diagnostics specifically for convection in the tropics in numerical weather prediction. And the reason we're interested in that is that in general, numerical weather prediction models tend to perform better in mid latitudes than in the tropics when it comes to um, scores for precipitation forecasts. For example, I'm showing here the equitable threat score, uh, frequency bias, and the fraction skill score. And the part, except for the frequency bias, the mid latitude, northern hemisphere mid latitude forecasts score much better than the um, forecasts in the tropics. Um, so, part of the reason could be that the underlying dynamics are, of course, very different in the tropics than the mid latitudes. And in the tropics, the convection is the main driver of precipitation. So you'd think that um, convective parameterization may have a larger impact on precipitation in the tropics than in the latitudes. Um, so what we want to do is we want to develop some metrics and diagnostics for numerical weather prediction in the tropics to better understand model behavior with respect to tropical convection. And we want to focus on uh, process-oriented diagnostics. And there are different challenges uh, when it comes to numerical weather prediction evaluation than climate model evaluation. The forecasts are shorter, they're a couple days to several weeks. The model versions change frequently, and it's very rare to have long as in multi-year time series of op operation of model runs, unless you're looking at uh, re-forecasts. Um, so here I'm going to focus on these diagnostics on the FA3 GFS and some results I'm going to show are going to be from the S2S database. And I'm going to use air interim and observe precipitation data sets uh, for the validation. I'm also going to consider diagnostics as a function of lead time. So um, if certain phenomena are initialized correctly, we can look at how long is the model able to keep that information and propagate that through the forecast. The um, <clears throat> diagnostics uh, I'm going to be looking at are Hoffmuller diagrams and pattern correlation between Hoffmuller diagrams to look at zonal propagation, space time coherence spectra to look at different scales of um, coupling of dynamics and moisture, vertical structure of coherence um, to take a look at what is the vertical structure of different convectively coupled equatorial waves that's associated with the convection. And then at different um, 
way of looking at convectively coupled equatorial wave activity and the skill score based on that. Um, so Hoffmuller diagrams, as I said, are, you can look at those to assess the zonal propagation of convective features. And when you um, compute the pattern correlation between the forecast and some measure of the truth, in this case, I'm using three different ones. I'm using air interim, trim precipitation, and the model analysis precipitation, um, which are these three different curves that I'm showing here. You can see that the FV3 GFS precipitation forecast quickly diverges from its own analysis. And by forecast hour 48, all three of these um, um, different methods of assessing the skill are about uh, the same and are below 0.5, so not very skillful. If you were looking at this in the mid-latitudes um, rather than in the tropics, you'd see a very different picture and you would see that this um, pattern correlation skill score is uh, above 0.5 and skillful for much longer into the forecast. The next uh, diagnostic is looking at space-time coherence spectra. And this can be used to look at how well do models initialize and propagate convectively coupled equatorial waves and using coherence spectra instead of power spectra allows you to look at, um, see the regions in wave number frequency space where tropical variability is active without having to estimate and remove a background from this. And we can evaluate the consistency between modeled and observed precipitation, which is the top row of panels that I'm showing, but it's also possible to evaluate the precipitation dynamics relationship which is uh, the two bottom rows where I'm looking at coherence between precipitation and divergence um, and how this changes with lead time. And in general, what happens is that while um, these waves are initialized pretty well by forecast hour 24 and 48, you're losing a lot of the coherence that you had in the initialization. Taking this a step further, you can also uh, when you compute this coherence, do this at every level and then average over the space-time region of interest. In this case, I'm showing the example for a Kelvin wave. And uh, the top is for air interim, which we're using as the validation in this case. And then the bottom two panels are for the forecast hour zero and forecast hour 24 forecast. And the results here, um, point to issues in the coupling between the large scale dynamics and the convection. Um, the divergence coherence with the Kelvin precipitation appears too weak and decreases with lead time. And although the vertical structure of the wave coherence is well represented at initialization, so the model is able to initialize these um, pretty well, but is not able to propagate them. A different way of looking at um, convectively coupled wave activity is to use a long time series of observed precipitation and filter that for the convectively coupled wave of interest and then compute UFs describing this um, signal. And in general, you only need the first two or first four UFs. So you end up with uh, only a few spatial patterns that you can then project the model precipitation onto at each forecast hour and thus get a um, convectively coupled wave activity index, uh, which I'm showing here in the top panel. And to make this into a skill score, you can then compute the anomal correlation between the observed and the model index. And here the bottom panel shows an example of two S2S models. The EC model, which seems to have skillful Kelvin predictions out to about four days on average. And the NSEP model, which only has um, skillful predictions out to about two days in this case. Looking at our FV3 GFS runs here with the same metric, you can see that the FV3 GFS run at C128 has um, a skillful Kelvin prediction out to about 48 hours, uh, similar with the mixed Rossby gravity waves. Um, equatorial Rossby wave forecast are skillful only for about the first 48, uh, 24 hours. And I'm not showing this here, but the MJO forecasts are not skillful based on this metric. And just, uh, I just- A little over a minute or so left. Okay, perfect timing. 
<laughs> so to summarize, we're looking at diagnostics for numerical weather prediction evaluation in the tropics focused on tropical convection or NOAA's NGGPS. And the focus here is on finding ways to assess the model's behavior on time scales longer than a few days, but using only these short numerical weather prediction model forecasts. We consider diagnostics as a function of lead time to be able to assess the origins of forecast error. So is it initial conditions versus is it a model error? And we're currently working on building a Python module for these diagnostics. And um, we're also planning on adding these capabilities to MedPlus and the model diagnostics task force. And I have a Python GitHub repo for these, and I'll make this public in the future, but I just wanted to say if anybody has um, model runs and they would like to apply these diagnostics, please let me know. I'm looking for guinea pigs to tell me what's not working and what is working in there. Okay, and that's it, thank you. All right. So, um, Michelle, are there any questions? Let's see, it looks like one just popped up from Krishna Kumar. Um, Maria, how good are the northward propagation of the MGO over the South Asian and East Asian monsoon regions in the models? Are there any diagnostics, um, any other diagnostics than what you presented? Oh, yeah, I haven't looked at that at all. Um, no, I had, these are the ones that um, we're mainly working on. Uh, one other one that I'm not showing is related to just simply looking at the precipitation relative humidity relationship. Um, but I haven't um, included that here because it's a slight, it's slightly different and it's not as um, far along as these diagnostics. But I have not looked at uh, northward propagation of MJO at all. All right. Um, well, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and, and just encourage others to write their questions.